left of the box. It's warm in here, which actually can bring me to the next little tidbit that I've had saved aside that I've been wanting to get to because this past winter has actually really depressed me. I'm one of the few people where the winter is a pick-me-up season because I love the snow. There's just so something so relaxing and rejuvenating to me to see the snow fall, to hear it fall, to feel it when I'm walking outside, to hear the crunch, the crispness of the cold air everything about winter I just absolutely love and in my part of Canada we didn't we didn't have winter we had a handful of days where we had like a big snow dump but there was no regular snow there was no time where snow was covering the ground for more than a week and so normally like I need the cold I need that kind of winter feel in order to survive the summer because I struggle in the heat. I can't handle it at all. And so now I'm going into this summer without even any inner coolness from the winter going on, without that kind of boost, because normally winter would last to the point where I'm like, okay, I feel like I can handle summer. I'm nowhere close to it right now. And it's already feeling warm here. And I already have like windows open, trying to let the cool air in and stuff. And it's really, making me nervous as to what this summer is going to look like. Well, there's lots of reasons to be worried about this climate change. So the breakdown says, if you're looking at these pictures thinking, this seems bad, it's because it is. It's really, really bad. And so the breakdown is a Twitter account that follows Albertan uh, politics. Really recommend that you follow them if you're in Alberta. So photos from a colleague showing a nearly empty Old Men Reservoir last night. This is the current state of Alberta's watershed during a water crisis. Water isn't just a commodity for human consumption alone. It supports entire ecosystems. Yes, yeah, so without any real major snowfalls in my part of Ontario, a lot of the water we, we rely on is groundwater. And so a lot of that's going to be dried up. Like, where do you go? Like, it, it's just... It always kind of bugs me when so many people were saying, oh, the weather's just so nice because we were hovering around zero degrees in the middle of winter when it should have been like negative 20. And people don't realize that we were in the midst of a massive heat wave. It's just scaled down. So when it's five degrees out, but when it's normally supposed to be negative 15, that's a big heat wave. Like in summer terms, that would be knocking us out. And so I understand that a lot of people don't like putting up with winter, the cold, the snow and all that sort of stuff. But it just, it, it kind of frustrates me that people, they don't understand climate change and see it as the threat it is when it's benefiting them in those moments. And they think to themselves, you know what, maybe this climate change isn't so bad if we're not going to have our winters here without the understanding of the wider impacts of what this is going to have on the ecosystem, on the watershed on the trees. I've talked about it plenty of times. Trees hibernate over the winter and now they're not really getting that type of hibernation. They're budding early or they, they bud and then it's almost like they have to unbud and then bud again and all that sort of stuff. You know, vegetation that would normally come up in April is coming up as early as February and it's happening so fast. There's no way for us to even know what kind of impact this is going to have on the ecosystem and what it's it's going to do long term. So when people are just kind of relaxed and chilled about climate change because it's like, oh, well, it's a very mild winter and this is very nice for us. It's not setting off the alarm bells the way it should be. You know, it is one of those existential crises that there's not much the individual person can do. So it's on us to put pressure on the governments because that's where the biggest changes need to happen in order for us to kind of get control of this. Because at this point, it's a train, like climate change is a train. So even if we do everything right, right now, it's still going to go into catastrophic territory. And so it's a matter of trying to manage that while doing things that will help slow down that train and hopefully reverse it. It's hard not knowing what the seasons are, what the weather's going to be, Put some more terror in the soul. Earth just experienced its hottest 12 months in recorded history. Uh, January has already broken temperature records starting this year 
off on course to break the global record set in 2023. 2024 was off to a record-breaking start as January was the warmest January ever recorded globally. Not only that, it was over a degree and a half warmer than the pre-industrial average and the eighth consecutive month of record monthly temperatures. Now we take a look back at the last 40 years or so, you'll notice the last 12 have been well above the uh, global surface air temperature normal. But 2024 takes the cake when faced with 2020 and 2016, we still surpass those years. Now, globally, you'll notice those reds, those deep reds, in particular over eastern Canada. Yeah, that's it's getting close to where I live. Canada indicating a high air temperature anomaly, but Western Canada got those darker blues indicating those cold Arctic temperatures you felt in January. And again, looking globally, you'll notice South America had its warmest January on record, as did Africa. When we look at back at the first three weeks of February, the trend continues, in particular for North America, sitting well above average, indicating a continued warming trend globally in the next coming months. It's scary stuff. And it does feel like it's out of our control and there's nothing we can do and stuff. It's on us to put the pressure on the government, but a lot of people just want to stick their head in the sand because it feels like it's such a big thing. But I was reminded, oddly enough, with Brian Mulroney. He was mostly a horrible prime minister. However, we used to have issues with the ozone layer, with acid rain. And even him, as a conservative government, were able to help put in policies that scaled that back, that reversed those situations. And those were pretty big at the time. Like, they were really dire. And I remember all the talk of the hole in the ozone layer and the dangers of the acid rain and what that means for the plant vegetation, for water and all that sort of stuff. But we help to, you know, I, I don't think it's gone away completely, but we helped make that change. We were able to put the policies in place. We were able to get industry to change, to help correct that. Climate change is solvable. This is a problem that can be solved. It's not so existential that there's nothing our governments can do to fix it. There's going to be bad days, no doubt about it. But we need to start building infrastructure that's going to be better able to tolerate these extremes that we're going to be facing in the future. There are things that can be done. And so it's on the people to really make that a priority with the government, to really push for it, to really, you know, make it known that they need to do their job about it. Because people's lives are literally on the line with it, with climate change. We're going to have so many, you know, environment refugees from places that are no longer livable within countries, within other countries trying to get into other countries and resources like water, especially water on the decline, drinkable water. It's hard not to be doom and gloom and doomer about this, but it's important to remind people it can be fixed. We can do things to lessen the impact of what it's going to be and eventually, hopefully, reverse course. So it's on us. Unfortunately, it's on the people. We need to make sure that the government knows that it is a priority. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's let's go back to the sandbox. Uh, Danner Christ, go to Maritime Sandy. I hear it's getting a winter. Yes, I'm one of the few people that will look at those snowstorms that they get and feel a little bit of envy. Because <laughs> I, I can't remember the last time we've had like such a massive snowstorm here. And... You know, part of me feels bad about it, too, because I know there's a lot of unhoused people, so I don't want them to suffer through it. So these mild winters are actually benefiting them. But I'd love to just be in a place for a little while that just gets a whole bunch of snow for a while and, and just enjoy it. Uh, Shade Dragon, I don't know. I'm in Alaska. It's cold enough. I like it here. I've never been to Alaska. But I do remember Alaska ran into a problem when they got a heat wave a few years ago where it was plus 30 and all that sort of stuff, because there's no air conditioners up there. Because <laughs> why would you need an air conditioner in Alaska? Uh, so as these little heat, heat domes move around and hits areas that aren't accustomed to it, 
people struggle more because there's fewer places they can go to get a relief from the heat. And there's a lot of European areas that have similar issues where their infrastructure just wasn't designed to handle the amount of heat that they're getting. Even in the States, a lot of the highways and roll, roads started to actually buckle under the heat that they've been getting in some areas. Uh, Lorelei says some crazy viruses about to thaw out and kill half the population. There's going to be issues with different types of illnesses traveling further north than maybe they would have traveled before. And who knows what kind of interactions they'll have with people and animals and other things that they've maybe never had contact with before. Plus, yeah, who, who knows what's in the permafrost? Dan or Christ, if we're being honest we're in the mitigation phase of climate change of the climate crisis people are going to die mostly people in the global south yeah i heard one statistic once that and this was a few years ago that every month one community in the united states like a city was basically being wiped off the map between hurricanes floods forest fires and all that sort of stuff that it was basically one community a month was being completely wiped off the map. And those people who survived need to go somewhere. But it is mostly people in the global south, in the hotter regions to begin with, that are going to be suffering the most. It's often the people with the people with the least suffer the most. And yeah, unfortunately that will be the case. I've talked about also like the struggles if you have disabilities in the climate change as well. I have an older video from a while ago that people can go check out when I was talking about the heat dome in uh, British Columbia, plus the um, wildfires that happened there. Because if you have, if you live in an area where there's a chance of forest fires, of uh, flash floods and all that sort of stuff, make sure you have an escape plan. And make sure if you have a neighbor or a family member who has a disability, that you include them in that. Because in the forest fires that happened in BC that one year, it was the people who can't run who didn't make it. So it's important that you incorporate that into any sort of escape plan that you might have.